Good afternoon to all. I am Arundhati Apsingikar and I welcome you to day 3, session 2 of MedInvade 2020, a panel discussion on artificial intelligence and technology in healthcare. Alongside me is Yuvraj Kaushal and both of us shall moderate this session. In simple terms, artificial intelligence or AI is centered around development of computer systems to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. From managing medical data, aiding in medical diagnosis, health tracking, treatment including robotic surgery, to medical assistance in the form of virtual nurses, the stakes of AI and technology in the field of healthcare are enormous. To enrich us with their experience and insights, we are privileged to have with us three renowned panelists, Dr. Sandeep Reddy, Dr. Anurag Agarwal, and Dr. Vidhur Mahajan. Dr. Sandeep Reddy is the Director of MBA Healthcare Management and a prodigious researcher in the field of AI healthcare based, on the, based at the Deakin School of Medicine, Australia, besides being the Founder Chairman of Medi AI, a globally focused AI company. Sir also functions as a certified health institution and is a World Health Organization recognized digital health expert. Dr. Reddy has a medical and healthcare management faculty and has completed machine learning and health informatics training from various sources. His current area of research revolves around the safety, quality, and explainability of the application of AI in healthcare delivery, in addition to developing AI models to treat and manage chronic diseases. Sir has been honored with numerous fellowships and awards for his exemplary contributions, some of which include Fellow of Australian Institution of Digital Health, Fellow of Academy of Translational Medicine Professionals, Fellow of Australian College of Health Service Management. Thank you for your presence today, sir. Yuvraj, please take over and introduce Dr. Agarwal. Thank you so much. Now, next, as a part of our panel, we have Dr. Anurag Agarwal. He is Director of CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology. After completing graduate medical education at the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, in the year of 1994, he further trained in internal medicine, pulmonary disease and critical care at Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, USA in 2003, followed by a PhD in physiology from Delhi University. His work is understanding the pathobiology of asthma, public health studies to define the current and projected burden of respiratory diseases, and efforts towards smart deployment of emerging technologies in artificial intelligence, digital health, and genomics have been appreciated globally. His lab's discovery of the crosstalk between metabolic health and respiratory disease with an emphasis on the key role of mitochondria led to his being awarded with the Shanti Sarubhatnagar Prize. His other key area of work have been in optimal generation of the use of data at scale with applications of data science towards public health. He is fellow of the National Science Academy, co-chairs the Lancet Financial Times Commission on Digital Health Futures 2030. He represents India on the global partnership of artificial intelligence in pandemic preparedness and is a member of the World Health Organization Technical Advisory Group for Digital Health. Sir, it is my honor to welcome you here. Pleasure to be here. Our third panelist, Dr. Vidur Mahajan, is the Head of Research and Development at Caring, which is the Center for Advanced Research on Imaging, Neuroscience, and Genomics. Sir pursued his MBBS from the prestigious Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College, Mumbai, and went on to complete an MBA with dual majors in Finance and Healthcare Management from the Wharton School of Business, USA. Caring is in current collaboration with more than 25 research groups across the world, and aims to bring revolutionary products in the AI space into clinical practice. The first paper on AI in Lancet was published by Kering. Under the R&D leadership of Dr. Mahajan, has published over 90 papers in the field globally. Sir is currently building a global platform for the development, testing, and deployment of advanced analytic solutions in clinical practice, and has been honored with the Herman O. West Fellowship and the Kaiser Fellowship, Thank you, sir, for sparing your valuable time to be with us today. Thank you so much. Sounds much better when somebody else says it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Sandeep Reddy, sir, 
healthcare students have a limited understanding of machine learning neural networks and natural language processing which form the very basis of ai in the field of healthcare can you please broaden our understanding on these concepts so Over it's probably you, easier yeah thank you thanks for the introduction earlier uh, it's probably easier if i share some slides because we're talking about definitions so i'll just check if i can actually share my screen sure sir just let me know if you can actually see the slides. Yes, sir. the presentation is visible. Sir. Yeah, so my uh, intention is to talk through the varying definitions of artificial intelligence and its components. So we'll start off with describing intelligent agent because this is fundamental to understand what artificial intelligence is. And many times when we look at the definition of artificial intelligence, there are quite a few definitions. They don't take this into consideration. So what is an intelligent agent? An intelligent agent is simply something that will perceive the environment and be able to take action again in relation to that. So you, here you got a illustration of an intelligent agent. So you got the environment in which the intelligent agent functions and it's got the sensors through which it perceives the environment. And then through a process of condition action rule, it affects some actions. So that's an artificial intelligent agent. So with artificial intelligence, it's basically a non-living uh, intelligent agent. And when you look at the textbook definition, it's quite a mouthful. It says a field of science concerned with the computational understanding of what is commonly called intelligent behavior and with the creation of intelligent agents that exhibit such behavior. It's not only mouthful, it's really, really hard to remember. So I formulated this definition, which is quite uh, easy to remember but also captures the essence of artificial intelligence, which is simply machines assuming human-like intelligence, whether they assume the whole spectrum of intelligence that's um, some years away and still debatable, but at least it uh, assumes the some aspects of human-like intelligence. It's quite easy to remember. So now within AI, there's categories, and depending upon the different sources of who you speak to, you get different uh, categories being pronounced. But from my understanding and from my reading, I categorize uh, AI into these three aspects. So one is machine learning, which is the most commonest form of AI that we see nowadays. And there's the newer uh, form of AI that's emerging, that's reinforcement learning. When I say new, relatively new. And then there's robotics. So let's walk through each of them Rather than give you a textbook definition of machine learning, which again will be hard for you to remember. So it's easier to direct you to this illustration where you have in the top, the traditional programming where you input the data and then the algorithm, which is nothing but rules. And then you get the output coming out of the computer software. But in machine learning, it's what we do is we provide the computer software or the AI model with the desired output and then feed in the data and then the machine itself through a process of pattern recognition, it identifies or devises rules. So that's why it's called machine learning. And the more the data you feed into the AI model, the AI model gets better because of uh, increased recognition and increased optimization. So now we have deep learning, which is an advanced form of machine learning. So what is deep learning? So deep learning, when you look at the architecture of the deep neural networks, it very much resembles our human neural network. So imagine the uh, circles are your cell body in a neuron and the lines, which are called edges in computer terminology are your axons. So you have a mesh of network there. So that because of those interconnections and that mesh of network and the layers, you get better performance with the AI model. And that's where a lot of success nowadays, which we see in the papers or in publications or in the news media is coming from because of that advanced form of architecture and the advanced layer. On the other hand, because of those layers, you also have a situation called black box kind of issue where because of the hidden layers, you can't unravel the decision-making process, which presents problem in the context of medicine, but we'll come to that later. And now, what's reinforcement learning? So you may recollect some years ago, DeepMind 
had a software called AlphaGo, which bet the reigning champion of Go, Leasty Doll. And basically they use this reinforcement learning type of model, which operates on a principle of reward and punishment. So when the uh, software or the AI model takes appropriate action, it gets rewarded, but when it doesn't, it gets punished, so to speak, or penalized. And over time, through a process of trial and error, it starts to get better. So that's reinforcement learning. It's relatively new. You don't see a lot of applications, but people are starting to see the utility of it in certain areas. And then finally, we have robotics. So we have to be careful, not all robots or not all robotics is AI. I'm talking about embodied AI. So we have the mechanical robots, which are not truly AI. We're talking about intelligent agents being embodied within a robotic shell. So that's when you get uh, AI enabled robotics. So that was in brief kind of a quick go through what AI definitions is. Obviously there's much more to that. There's subsets of machine learning, traditional machine learning, and there's newer forms of uh, machine learning coming through, but that should give you a gist of what artificial intelligence is. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep for taking us into this world of AI and actually telling us what are the parts of it. Now I uh, would like to ask Dr. Anurag, where we still under, are understanding the world of AI what space does it have in the field of genomic medicine? Please share your thoughts with us. Sure. So AI, as you know, Sandeep described very nicely, is at various levels, right? I mean, if we were to think of applications of the type of work, if you remember his diagram with the computer, you provide an input, you provide the output, and the machine learns how to classify, right? Uh, machine learns optimizing the learning. So how to get that output from this input? Now in the world of genomics, what are your basic problems? Your problem number one is you have a large amount of raw data that comes out of sequencing. This data needs to get aligned into what you would call a genome. The genome does not come out, you know, like a billion bases. Uh, Let me know when to we start again. Yes, sir. So we we are live, sir. Uh, oh, we I, are live? I, yes, sir. We are live. I'll ask you, Raj, to reintroduce Dr. Anurag, uh, sir. No, he doesn't Charlie. need to introduce me. Just ask the question again so people know. Yeah, yes, sir. Question, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. First of all, we're really sorry for the technical glitch. Hope it doesn't like, happen again. And Dr. Anurag, I would really like you to share your thoughts with us that what space AI has in the field of genomic medicine. Okay, uh, thanks. So in the world of genomics, you can think of the applications of AI at two or three different levels. Level one is the level of data itself, because when you run something through a sequencer, depending on what type you use, the data is actually pretty dirty. What do you want from it? You want a sequence? You want to know the variant. You want to know which variant is important. And in case you have a patient in mind, you want to see if this particular variant is causing a given particular disease that you're interested in. And if you already have a specific disease in mind, you want to know what all could be causing it and check for it. Now take level one. Level one is a huge amount of data comes out. Let's imagine that you have a pore through which you're passing a DNA strand sequence. Now, every time a DNA base passes through the pore, the current changes a little. Based on how much the current changes, you make a call for a particular base. That's the nanopore principle. But nothing is beautiful and clear, right? You got four different patterns for four different type of bases, but only by using machine learning, will you be able to classify <clears throat> a given type of pattern that has come on your voltage uh, graph and say, this is likely to be the variant, although it doesn't fit perfectly. You can't do this declaratively. You cannot say it has to be exactly this, because the real world is never that sharp. So this program, for example, would be called Deep Nano. The word deep comes all over. So you notice Dr. Reddy talked about deep mind. After deep mind, everything deep has possibly come. So there is deep nano, there is deep variant, there is clairvoyant, 
all these things help you call a particular genetic variant from the data that you have. The next level is which variant is important and which variant might be doing something. That leads you to another AI level. Prediction of what different variants would do. If you want to predict a deleterious effect upon the genome, you have to start giving lots of examples. Going back to his computer example of inputs and outputs, these are known variants likely to cause deleterious things. These are variants that disrupt proteins and based on which the AI system can help you call which variant is likely to be bad. The last one is the genotype phenotype clinical application. And there are programs like Deep Gestalt. You give a photograph of a patient and the program will tell you these are the likely genetic disorders. Then it can pull all known variants. Then it can look at the genetic variants being called and start matching them. So this is a very nice clinically important example. Uh, Deep Gestalt is a starting point on the phenotype, but you would run with actual a sequence of all things. And the last, which we haven't really succeeded in yet, given this disease, what is the biology? I have got 10,000 diabetics. Here are their genomes, here are their transcriptomes, here are their proteomes, here are their metabolomes, kind of an extension of the world of genomics. Tell me what causes diabetes. We haven't quite got there yet. I mean, I don't even think we'll get there anytime very soon. But the first three examples are practical real examples happening today. The last one is where we hope to go in time to come. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Agarwal. I now request Dr. Mahajan, sir, to speak on frontiers of research and development in AI, particularly in imaging sciences. Uh, uh, thanks so much, guys, for uh, having me here. You know, it's always very exciting to be addressing an MBBS or a medical audience, uh, you know, or a, a medical students, in fact. Uh, because the kind of questions uh, uh, that come to your minds are very, very different from, uh, you know, the uh machine learning community or the engineering community so i was very excited when you know sai and all reached out and organized this uh so i think a lot has been said about uh ai as it stands today uh per se uh so i will uh, i'll maybe just give like a brief uh, you know definition that that i try to adhere to of ai that is you know kind of a timeless uh, definition which uh, essentially is uh, that uh, ai is whatever machines can't do yet uh, in fact you know this statement was given in the 1960s it's called tesla's theorem i found it on wikipedia like most things in life uh, but uh, you know it it's a very interesting definition uh, when one says that you know ai is whatever machines can't do yet because whatever machines start doing we stop considering that as ai you know, like, for example, every time you use Google Maps, you don't really think that you are interacting with a, you know, semi-intelligent uh, agent, as uh, Sandeep sir described it. Or, uh, you know, every time you're using Google search, you're not really thinking that you're probably interacting with the world's most advanced uh, natural language processing AI system. Like, it's just a tool, right? You just use these things and you move on. Uh, so that's why, you know... Uh, whenever machines start doing something like much of the genomics work, right? Much of the ma genomics machine learning, you know, nobody even considers it uh, AI per se because it's just ubiquitous. So always, always keep that in mind and, you know, always uh, try to think of how, uh, uh, you know, definitions uh, evolve uh, with uh, with time. Uh, now coming, coming to your question on, uh, you know, the future of AI in uh, maybe uh, diagnostics and then more specifically imaging. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you have to think of things in frameworks. At least I think of things in frameworks, right? So there are uh, essentially three things uh, that are part of healthcare. The first is uh, prevention, right? If you look at the disease journey, you know, you've all studied your PSM and all that. And, uh, you know, so prevention is the first thing. So prevention and population health is probably the first thing. A lot of AI being done there, you know, COVID-19, a lot of the decision making that many governments have done is, is actually on population health. Then next comes diagnosis, right? So when we are trying to prevent disease, the, the patient essentially has no symptoms. There are no complaints. There is nothing. It's just we are trying to make our population healthy. Then the patient does develop some kind of complaints. And that's when they enter this realm of diagnosis. 
right? And once you have established a diagnosis, you move on to therapeutics. So uh, prevention, diagnosis, therapeutics, these are the three you know, pillars uh, on which a lot of AI applications are being built. Uh, radiology and imaging per se are part of the second, which is diagnostics. Uh, you know, uh, most of you know that diagnosis, there are essentially two types of diagnosis one does uh, in vivo diagnostics and in vitro diagnostics. Uh, in vivo diagnostics is generally, you know, radiology, nuclear medicine, or endoscopies, colonoscopies, you know, or even just visually looking at a patient, like the entire clinical diagnostic side of things is also, I, I bucket that into in vivo uh, diagnostics. And then there is in vitro diagnostics, right, which is all your lab medicine, histopathology, even genomics, etc, where, you know, you're taking uh, a piece out of uh, the human body, if I may, and, and trying to run some tests on it. And hence, you're trying to, uh, you know, decipher what exactly might be uh, the problem. So uh, within diagnostics in vivo in imaging, uh, what we deal with are photographs, right? So what is a radiology department, right? Uh, if you ever visit your radiology department in your hospital uh, and you look at it the way I look at it, you will realize that it is just a, a very, very advanced Photoshop, right? Uh, people, patients walk in. Uh, we use really fancy cameras to click pictures of those patients. You know, we use MRI scans, CT scans, ultrasound, X-ray, uh, PET CT, gamma camera, you know, like 256 slices, etc. But at the end of the day, we are taking pictures of these patients. And then we have an extremely smart group of people who are radiologists who look at these pictures and try to figure out what is wrong with the patient, right? So AI, now why am I telling you all of this, right? Why am I telling you this entire story is because uh, AI plays a part in each of these aspects. The first, the patient walking into the radiology department, scheduling, right? AI is changing the game immensely. There are groups uh, in Brazil and the US that are using uh, machine learning techniques to figure out, will my patient be late, right? Because all of you are, are, are in hospitals and you realize that scheduling a patient is probably one of the most painful things that one goes through because... Uh, you know, people get late, doctors get late, patients get late, machines uh, break down. So they're using machine learning to figure out things like, uh, you know, pre-scanning uh, things where like, will the patient reach on time? Uh, will the machine break down and hence uh, delay my patients? So things like that, right? That's the patient walking in. Second is the actual act of taking the photograph. An MRI machine today typically takes anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes to do an MRI scan, right? It's a broad range. It can even go up to 60 minutes. But there are now AI techniques uh, out there that people are using that aim to bring this down, not by a factor of two, three or five, but by a factor of 10, right? So how can you do a one minute MRI and give results that are comparable to maybe a 10 or a 15 minute MRI? Right. So that is the act of clicking the picture. Same thing with CT scanning. CT scans, can, uh, one of the problems with CT is radiation dose. Right. You can't just keep doing CT scans of the same person again and again and again. But you you can use AI techniques to reduce the uh, radiation dose by a factor again of, you know, 10 to 100. So, uh, so this is, you know, again, the person walking in, scheduling, pre-scanning, a lot of AI, the actual image acquisition which is the cutting down on time, cutting down on radiation, improving on quality. That is the uh, whole uh, image acquisition part. And then third comes the holy grail, right? Which is the diagnosis, which is where you are right now, you know, we are just in the domains of machines. Now we are coming into the domain of what a radiologist actually does. And here, you know, there are techniques, I'm sure if you just Google, uh, you know, uh, deep learning radiology, you will find a huge range of papers that talk about automatically diagnosing pneumonia on chest x-rays, automatically diagnosing brain tumors on MRI scans, automatically diagnosing prostate cancer on prostate MR, anything and everything, you know, predicting dementia on PET-CT, like every body part that you have, 
there is a paper probably that has been written on automatically identifying certain kind of findings in that so the point i'm trying to make is that you guys are at a very very exciting stage in life where you can literally access these uh, ai techniques very very easily like they are and most of them are free like you don't even need to pay anything you don't need to do anything there is enough course work out there there is enough compute out there that you can start working on these things yourself and you have you know within radiology you have such a wide spectrum you have the entire human body and then you have the entire uh, you know patient walking in image acquisition diagnosis and then let's you know i'll not even get into follow up because that's another pandora's box but so uh, yeah with that i'll stop talking otherwise i can just keep going 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 but uh, you know it's a very exciting time to be a, a student of medicine and uh, yeah don't don't stop thank you sir for sharing with us some interesting facts like tesla's theorem or about the frameworks associated with ai and taking us into the world of imagery now i'd like to invite all the panelists to raise any question or add in any point if they have in other panelists speech or the areas of interest they have Yeah, I'll, I'll ask one to I'll ask one to Dr. Reddy. So, uh, Sneep sir, I think it's it's critical for uh, you know med students across the world to understand this uh, the concept of the black box and explainability. Uh, you know, because I think they are the ones who will be kind of forced to unravel the black box. So, if you can share your thoughts on that, uh, even I would be curious to hear. But uh, you know, more more for them would be great. Firstly, I would like to agree with you, Vidur, about this being an exciting time. AI is the zeitgeist of these times, and medical students are now in a position to be able to learn this cutting-edge technology. Not just AI, just the whole digital health kind of things. I did my medical school, obviously, from India, just like you, Vidur, and just like Anurag, and we don't get taught anything about digital health or um, e-health. And those kind of innovations are happening nowadays, and this is really exciting time. So now to answer your question, uh, so in terms of uh, explainability, it's probably not that very important when you look at AI in other sectors, but in terms of the context of medicine, we are very much thought about the causation model. And we look at a deterministic kind of approaches in terms of how we diagnose and how we uh, provide advice in regards to therapeutics and treatment. So it really becomes tricky when you actually have deep learning kind of models. We got to remember not all AI is non-explainable. Some of the models, traditionally classical machine learning models like uh, random forest, decision tree models, the earlier uh, expert kind of systems, they were pretty much explainable in that sense. They were, were based on symbolic approaches. But now we are moved to Bayesian probabilistic kind of approaches and also in terms of the architecture of deep learning we have that black box issue but having said that there are nowadays uh, explainable frameworks like lime and shapley values which are really providing some insights into how decision making is provided not the complete sort of decision making process mathematically that's very hard but in terms of um, some aspects of the key features that are identified or utilized by AI models, those kind of insights are available. Especially so in uh, medical imaging, you will be familiar with the GradCam models, uh, GradCam frameworks. So there are uh, people working on that, but I think at some point of time, it's gonna be hard when you actually start to integrate AI into the clinical workflow. And then there's the medical legal issues that may emerge when things go wrong, who is responsible is it the AI software and how do we actually pinpoint it to the AI? So those kind of things, issues emerge. Um, machine learning uh, scientists, some of the machine learning scientists at least are quick to dismiss the uh, relevance of explainability, but they come from a very different approach in that sense. They don't necessarily take the vicarious responsibility, which we are taught in forensic medicine and other and in, in our medical uh, training. So those kind of issues uh, quickly emerge. On the other hand, we have issues like workforce shortages, information asymmetry, um, increasing burgeoning costs of healthcare services, and people are running out of solutions. And they've tried every kind of solution and they're quickly looking back to or reverting back to e-health and digital health solutions. So I think the 
uh, following questions will be I'll be touching upon what should be done in terms of setting up the infrastructure in terms of incorporating AI. But I'll stop there so that I don't take more, much more of the panelists and the uh, discussion time. So with it, I'll continue on that for a little while. Sandeep, I'm gonna use you as an example right now because you're using a virtual background. Now in the virtual background for, and maybe Sandeep can see it for himself, but those of you who are watching, we'll see the right side here on Sandeep's face is coming correctly. On the left side, it periodically appears and disappears, right? And this is fundamentally an AI algorithm running at the back end, trying to figure out where exactly his face from wherever he's sitting, how much is his face, then substituting a virtual background against him. So removing his background and putting a virtual thing. Now, again, I do not know exactly what is the lighting where he's sitting, but I would guess that somewhere there's something dark on the left side of his face because that's where the algorithm is having trouble making out the outer edge of the boundary of his black colored hair, which is still black, unlike mine that are gray and white, and is not able to figure it out and keeps making it appear and disappear. Now, right now, it doesn't matter, right? Right now, it does not matter in the slightest. We are all talking to each other. We all know exactly how a human being looks and whether it puts in the hair or it doesn't put in the hair, we can imagine Sandeep the way he must be. Now change this to a medical context change this to a medical context when AI is creating determinations, cleaning out signals, imagine it's an ECG. It's a noisy ECG coming out of a smartwatch and you know you cannot get a smooth ECG in a person who is moving and there is sweat. It is never clean. Those of you who have done any ECG know how difficult it is in the best of circumstances to get a noise free ECG when you got gel holding those electrodes to the body surface. And yet you've got Apple watches giving you what looks like a beautifully clean ECG. Uh, that looks just perfect, right? It's a lot of cleaning is happening behind the scene. A lot of it is expectation of what a normal ECG looks like and the machine is learning it. And sometimes because of that expectation, things can go wrong. The more you understand about what the machine is doing, the more explainable it is, the more medicine demands it. But to be very honest, medicine demands it because regulators demand it. Regulators will not let you clear an algorithm unless they understand it. And what we call explainability or the black boxes Sandeep was talking about are typically only tell you what, where AI, AI was looking. They don't really tell you what AI was seeing. Where an AI was looking can be told by progressively removing parts of the image and seeing which part of the image, if it is removed, makes the AI's predictions go haywire. Those have come out as activation maps. But where you are, and sometimes it's very useful. I mean, two examples I can give you, mostly from Vidur's area of imaging. One is where it turned out the AI for detection of pneumothorax where the lung drops was looking at the chest tube. If the chest tube was present, there was a pneumothorax. Now that's absolutely correct. It's also very useless. The chest tube is only placed after you know there's a pneumothorax. In another example, it turned out the AI was looking at the label on the top right of the X-ray. The label indicated where the X-ray was coming from, from the cancer unit or the non-cancer unit. It was faster to determine whether the cancer was identifiable because the patient was coming from the cancer ward as opposed to seeing the cancer itself. So it's very important to know where the AI is looking, but you will find plenty of examples where AI looks like it is looking in the right place, but still what it is seeing, nobody can make out. I also agree with Sandeep. It's a bit of a current mentality. At some point we will all get used to, even now today, we don't actually ask about the Apple watch. We don't ask about the genome sequencers. We don't ask about the image generation from CT machines and MRI machines. They're already well beyond our medical understanding and we are not deterministic in the way we think about it. Slowly, the mindset will change. Uh, as doctors, we will learn to give up more and more of what we believe we are fully in control of. Part of it is a rational belief and we'll become more accepting of what the machines do for us. Instead, we will focus on how rigorous is the testing of the machine? 
how many scenarios in which is it tested and how confident can we be it will not malfunction because of unknown glitches and in the end you have seen challenger explode no matter how much you test things go wrong in medicine because the cost can theoretically be as much as death we are very very worried about it but in reality you know mistakes happen every day and we will learn to live with how doctors and ai will work together i'll stop here thank you sir thanks a lot that was interesting of course uh, dr sandeep sir as you said that at your times as you said e health was not really uh, taught to you or any of your batchmates so uh, do you suggest that uh, med tech should be included in the modern day medical curriculum let me clarify i work in a medical school here in australia and even in australia i don't think we necessarily incorporate e health as part of our medical curriculum so some of the medical schools including my medical school are looking at that um, but it doesn't really a formal sort of inclusion in the medical curriculum so it's, i don't think india is unique in fact in what i see from the discussions i have been in part of there is increasing interest in india more though, more so than in australia but having said that here in australia let, let me give you an example telehealth has been around for a quite considerable amount of time it's only because of the covid pandemic that really the authorities and the policy makers have recognized the importance of telehealth and uh, been able to fund it in terms of the medicare scheduling so for so it's been so the case even in the united states but coming back to your question i think the time you graduate you'll be increasingly seeing uh, you already see electronic you also be seeing mobile health you'll be seeing ai you'll be seeing internet of things you'll be seeing vr ar and maybe a couple of years from now or 10 years from now other new sort of technologies that are emerging and there is a lot of discussion about how these uh, technologies will augment the role of the doctor and enhance the performance of the doctors in fact there's a lot of discussion saying that it will make medicine more much more humane so from that perspective absolutely i'm an advocate for education about e health but it has to be done in a very systematic manner it shouldn't be like in a form of a gimmick because ai is now the fad ai is now the hype as vidur was saying earlier so right now we see ai as something being done by machines so if you go back to electricity many years ago electricity electricity was new and now electricity is very common we don't say electricity driven televisions electricity driven microwaves so electricity has become part of our regular work so i think ai will become part of our uh, regular scheduling regular clinical workflow but again that's something we need to understand especially in terms of the black box issue especially in terms of the evolving ai model once we move from the weak ai to narrow ai to general ai i think we need to really be aware of how these models work Let Let just add some add to what a, sorry go ahead with no problem go ahead go ahead go ahead uh, so, no just to add you know so i uh, and in fact uh, this uh, is stemming from a conversation i had with dr anurag only i think almost a year ago where uh, he's trying to introduce you know somewhat like a md in informatics uh where you know like part of the discussion was okay an md in informatics is for a person who's maybe decided to spend you know a considerable amount of their life in informatics but what do you do for uh, you know everyone uh, who goes through mbbs and my view on that is that and i have like i'm saying this having no idea what you guys actually study today uh but uh, uh the the thing is that every uh, subject or every chapter Uh, you know could have an element of med tech to it right so if you're studying physiology you know maybe there could be a, a short answer question on sensors if you're studying uh, uh, anatomy you know maybe there could be a short thing on uh, augmented reality or or vr if you're studying surgery you know like laparoscopic surgery was big when i was uh, in uh, in medical school which is actually not that far back but uh, Uh, so so i think you know those are maybe maybe that is a better way of introducing uh, you know advanced uh, techniques and technologies uh, to medical students than actually having a separate course on uh, you know ai or informatics or uh, you know digital health as you may 
say because it's actually it, it's it's nothing it's like you know it's like having a separate course on a stethoscope uh you know like you don't need a separate course on a stethoscope you use it you know for chest medicine in one way for cardiology in another way for uh you know i don't know a third application but pediatrics maybe <laughs> but but uh, uh so so i think uh, and having sessions like these i think is a great uh, uh, opportunity for people to pick up on you know maybe small small ideas and then try to uh, dive deep into those so uh, anurag sir not sure uh, i'm not sure whether i mean kind of on the same line but a little bit differently uh why do you go to any college at all and the what is the college supposed to provide you it's supposed to provide you in my opinion core competencies that must be learned by everybody it must also give you the opportunity to learn additional things that you may want to and to know what you want to learn it must provide you opportunity of knowing what the frontiers are now so assuming there is a core curriculum at end of every curriculum you get to know what the frontiers in that area is vidu talked about physiology for example and recording and interpretation of physiological signals as a frontier introduces you to computational which doesn't have to be ai by the way uh and then you should have the ability to pick up something that you want to do in addition to that and today anyway it's about inverted classrooms right uh my daughter may or may not enter medical school this year but if she does you know i was only talking to her i was speaking to one of my colleagues who is a medical doctor teaching informatics at triple it delhi and his point was he gives everybody an advice the best lectures by some of the best people in the world are part of massively open online courses learn only the frontiers from your teachers ask them where the future might be go look at these things yourself from the moocs why settle for a person who might be willing to join a medical college uh, which are not very well known for taking non medical people instead initially build it upon the best available thing on the internet you're living in a new age and that brings us back to what sandeep was saying which i completely agree with there will be things that you know your schools your systems will be strong in take the best of that make sure the opportunities are provided and remember there will be nothing called electricity different microwaves and so on very soon ai will just be one more word that will be lost will be ubiquitous around us don't get caught into how electricity is produced which well in india to get into the medical entrance exam you probably have to learn a lot of necessary stuff but pretty much you forget most of it later on very soon a lot of ai will be like that learn applications most doctors are planning to become professionals most of them are not planning to become researchers to be a good professional you need to understand applications not necessarily always the core deep science sometimes i wonder today there's already too much science to even capture in four and a half years uh, i was recently at the ministry of health and family welfare when they saw me or the course was being planned for the new group of people when they saw me they said oh let's add in some ai as well i was telling them no 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 don't do it <laughs> uh, leave it as something you know optional bring in the name in fact if you want to teach somebody talk about virtual reality and robotics that's more relevant application that people might actually work with but again i'll stop there i certainly would not want a planned course on ai for every medical student of the country a it cannot be done equitably between different medical colleges just to kind of contrast with what sandeep said uh, i did my medical school between 89 and 94 in aims new delhi we had an excellent computer center and i spent most of my time in medical school learning to program in c++ and i was semi professional by the time i ended my mbbs so i was already doing a to d conversion recording physiological signals writing interpretation for spirometry for people with lung function testing and actually people paid me for that in the first some time i finished medical school but these opportunities were unique to the fact that only aims had these computer centers and aims also had the non compulsory attendance by the way which has gone away since then but don't start things at a national scale that you can't actually do well across the country that would be my only advice i'll stop thank you sir um dr agarwal you would also like you to comment on the impact that this rapid development of ai has had you know over the last two decades globally what is the impact on healthcare providers and also on the healthcare industry uh, 
while i answer that let me clarify something that is sometimes not known to people neural networks the basic concepts of deep learning are not new at all if you look at uh, yan likun or anybody else is their work is from the 80s what actually changed in the last two decades that made all the technology described in the 80s have uh, become reality actually it is data and compute uh compute is the easy answer but that's in itself not true it is also data until the world became digital there was simply not enough digital data to leverage these kinds of techniques and of course the techniques have also got refined especially with new developments where machines train themselves by simulating images but basically what has happened in the last two decades as the world has digitized first digital skills have become critical for doctors forget anything else learn whether you are on zoom here today or anywhere else the world has become a digital world with electronic medical records and so on then from that ai has come behind the scenes ai like uh, when vidur was speaking about scanners when i was speaking about sequencing machines uh, sandeep gave multiple broad examples behind the scenes ai has made everything work faster more efficiently and allow us to do things with either less radiation or less dna or with greater accuracy or with greater throughput this in turn has simply led to even more data explosion if you can do more scans per day if you can sequence more genomes per day you keep increasing the data now this becomes a beautiful spiral the better it becomes behind the scenes the more in front of the scenes data it creates the more front uh, data it creates the better new applications come and when these applications come doctors become almost used to doing all this there is a program now called ada if any of you want to put in a symptom checker it's one of the best ones around i mean i'm not saying it's the best one i'm not advertising them but it's one of the best ones around most of it is not ai most of it is simple symptom reasoning engine but if you wanted to make it better if you had a little lesion on your skin or you had a genetic disease how could you make it a better you could tie it to something like deep gestal take a photograph of the child and apart from symptom reasoning it can also look at the photograph and tell you the genetic disorder take a picture of your skin it might even tell you the lesion on your skin so in the last two decades we have seen changes in the way we apply these technologies in the beginning only to make our workflow smoother now to the point we are doing things we could never imagine earlier i'll stop Thank you, sir. Doctor Vidhu, I would like you to tell us how are we planning to train the already working staff to handle these latest tools and technologies, as you all are telling us about. I think uh, you know that's a that's actually a very very insightful question, and I have a very you know contrarian kind of view on it. Uh, you know, how many people here have actually been trained to use WhatsApp? like i would assume it would be maybe zero or you know maybe our grandparents who are above the age of 80 or something maybe we needed to have like a 3 minute session with them to you know tell them ki acha you know this is where you type and this is you know this is what you press to send and like my grandmom she's uh, close to 90 right now and she's supremely active on whatsapp so this you know training question is actually not a training question it is a design question we need to make our solutions such that anyone can use them right now obviously it's a broad generalization you know whatsapp is relatively simple from a user's perspective you send messages receive messages but it is also the most widely used teleradiology or telemedicine platform on the planet right like it it allows you to do everything that you want to do so uh, the the challenge has been that and you know maybe this is again another controversial statement that healthcare technology has been designed always by healthcare people for healthcare providers so if you look at a uh, the interface of an mri machine and if you see uh, the number of options that are available there would probably be close to you know 50 to 60 potential buttons that a technologist can press but if you actually study their working you'll realize that they are genuinely using only five of those buttons or maybe seven 
right and the others are you know just in case you need these features kind of features so uh, th that is why you know i i truly believe uh, and this makes the answer to this question very short that uh, you know you you need to find people who are going to design uh, these technologies not thinking that the person at the other end uh, is a healthcare service provider uh, but thinking that the person at the other end is simply a user right and the moment we cross that chasm it will be it will be absolutely simple which is why you know there is a wave of newer health it companies that is uh, that are doing the rounds that are actually that use the google philosophy right you go to google.com you don't see any options whatsoever you just see the search bar right as opposed to the uh, yahoo philosophy where if you go to yahoo.com you will see like 500 different things and you can choose right like who is right or wrong you can decide yourself but uh, so that's that's the challenge and that will be the challenge to you guys as well because uh, you know as you as i i hope some of you get into this whole digital health thing you you will have to put yourself into the a uh, feet of a ot technician or of a radiographer or of a lab specialist or uh, you know or uh, anybody else who provides health healthcare to patients like doctors uh, nurses etc and see you know how do you make their life simpler using technology so the goal of the technology should not be to gather the data or the goal of the technology should not be to deploy the ai the goal of the technology should be to make people's life simpler and then you know they'll automatically start using it uh, so So yeah, so design is at the root of this. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Sandeep uh, Anurag sir, if you guys agree with this, but you know, like this is my crazy kind of thinking. No, I totally agree. No, I, it's a design issue now. Yeah. yeah, I too agree with you. But there is some nuances in medicine that we have to take into consideration in terms of the responsibility doctors have, healthcare professionals have, as opposed to WhatsApp, which isn't in terms of medical legal sort of context, not that very complex. So, for example, I'll give you an example. What Google has done, their diabetic retinopathy sort of application was touted as really performing much better than ophthalmologists, and there was a lot of publicity around it. And congratulations to them; they followed it up with an evaluation study of how it worked in Thailand. And what they found was the performance in terms of the ground realities was very, very dismal because of many contextual issues: the lighting, the lack of training of nursing professionals the lack of harmony between the application and the ground realities and those kind of things came into fore so my point is that ai is unlike other technologies because it's in terms of its what it can do its prowess whether it's what it's doing now and its potential is much more than say uh, uh, the previously used uh, technologies like telephones or those kind of things which kind of now are taken for granted but now we are talking about something that can potentially repl replace aspects of doctors aspects of uh, what healthcare professionals do i think there is some element of responsibility that goes with that and when you talk about responsibility there has to be some training associated with that but i do agree with you the user interface and user design is paramount in this kind of discussions Dr. Reddy, you just spoke about the legal. You just a little brief talk about the legal aspect. So, what are the ethical implications related to AI, and how can we ensure safe usage of AI and technology in the healthcare delivery system? It's a very good question. Uh, let me share some information on the screen. Yes. So one of the things that we need to take into account is um, depending upon where you come from and what your background is and what kind of experiences you had, the ethical issues can be quite nuanced and quite complex. But generally, when you look at the discourse around ethics, you get some key themes that come about. So one is bias, and I don't need to explain bias. It's a prejudice against a group or an individual, which may lead to adversarial outcomes. And there is also the mathematical bias that is associated with al uh, algorithms. But I won't go into that today. But biases can be introduced in terms of the development of the AI model during the design, during the data training, and um, obviously later on when the model starts to interact with the environment. 
And because of the biases, you could have discrimination uh, in relation to gender, ethnicity, disability, and age. In fact, we've seen already seen examples. There have been a couple of recent examples where they found discrimination against African-Americans in terms of the uh, AI models. But we also talked about the black box issue, which can lead to a lack of transparency and lack of accountability, so to speak. And then when we have uh, AI models being incorporated into uh, regular workflow and their performance exceeds that of the healthcare professionals, you may get a uh, point at some point of time where AI, there is an aut autonomous bias or what you call the autonomous delegation that AI gets the unintended power and authority and that can also lead to issues. And then there's the trust issue, trust kind of two ways. One hand, you can have physicians and healthcare professionals not trusting AI to uh, do very well, even though in silico and in the lab, in uh, studies, they may have shown a lot of uh, successes, but they may not actually trust it to be safe and uh, you know safe to use in the clinical work, work environment. On the other hand, you can get healthcare professionals, uh, including doctors, uh, trusting of AI in that, that they do not uh, engage with the AI and let all the decision making uh, delegate devolve their decision making to the AI, and that could also lead to issues. So, having said that, I think from a safety and quality perspective, it's also important to remember there are other elements that we have to take into consideration. When you look at the discourse around ethics, they often ignore the regulatory challenges and the medical legal aspects. And in, I'm I'm glad that we are having this discussion about the other components that are necessary for a safe and uh, quality use of AI. So from a regulatory perspective, a couple of countries are doing some pioneering things like in the US, the uh, Food and Drug Administration, and in the UK, uh, and here also in Australia, there's a lot of discussion happening around how do we actually uh, enable a safe and quality use of AI in healthcare, but it's still early days. Uh, there's much more to be done uh, in terms of uh, clear frameworks, clear guidelines as to what AI can do. But we all obviously this kind of guidelines have to take into consideration how AI models are designed, who gets into their design process. Uh, nowadays, we talk about patient-centric care. So it's also important when AI models develop, there is consultation with patients or involvement of patients. Otherwise, we may have uh, issues on, uh, uh, later on. So there is also issue about uh, audits. Uh, do we have audits? I know Vidur is engaged uh, in that kind of um, uh, processes and uh, you know, guidances. Um, and also in terms of when the data gets collected, uh, uh, do we actually get uh, patient consent in the um, collection of the data, collection of the data so that there is privacy and security preserved? And coming, coming to in terms of uh, the legal issues, um, the issues really that are quite complex, but I think there are two issues that kind of may come into four. One is the when the, uh, because of the AI, there's some mishap who becomes responsible? Is it the software designer? Is it the health service or the vendor? It isn't really clear because there aren't really any clear cut laws around that in any part of the world. So I think there is uh, some work to be done in that regard. But again, that is something that the um, government and the legal authorities have to take responsibility for. So that kind of gives you a picture as to how the uh, current uh, situation is in terms of the uh, ethical, medical, legal, and uh, regulatory aspects. And it's quite early days. There's much work to be done. But having said that, I think there is some work being done across the board. Let me add, to, you, that. Yes, Let me add to that one a little bit. Uh, fundamentally, there was a company in India that was looking at ECG interpretation and services for people. And you know that even normal ECG machines are like 99% accurate by now. Uh, their trouble was the following. If they create packaged health services, then somebody has to then also give the advice. And given it is so easy to read an ECG, if they're going to have a cardiologist on panel and pay them money to give advice, they might as well let them, let them read the ECG as well. So... In the end, all that really happened is the device alerts the cardiologist, the cardiologist reads ECG, and the advice is given at the same time. So ultimately, medicine is professional, far beyond academic. It comes with all these liabilities, and companies will take the safe decision. If they're going to anyway hire a doctor, 
the ai might be there so my wife for example is a radiologist they have ai systems that read for bleeding in the head they use it only to triage cases let a case that is a suspected bleed be read fast by a radiologist who moves at the top of the queue then they read it they report it they will never use it to actually create the report because ultimately somebody has to make the call also right somebody has to describe it somebody has to be available for questions and once it is marked and you have radiologist on staff it will be a completely different business model now you can think of a village in a village there is no doctor at all there is no radiologist now who takes the liability becomes a great question will the software company do it they will write a disclaimer we are advisory doctor may decide there is no doctor so eventually the government will take the responsibility if it wants to implement otherwise there will be no implementation and the system will remain exactly the way it is so lots of innovative things will need to be found by the way one thing we see in ai always is that you can learn continuously and update itself the fda rules very clearly indicate the algorithm will be certified at the time of evaluation it cannot learn any further or it will need revaluation so it's quite interesting how this will go i'll stop thank you sir dr vidu we have talked so much lately about what all is there in ai or how can we incorporate it can you enlighten us about some cutting edge products that we can sooner see in clinical practices no i think uh, th- there are there are quite a few and uh, you know again yeah i'm sorry but i you know how do you define soon <laughs> so <laughs> so i think you know if we are to say that in the next 5 years let's say uh you know what are and uh, now you know again see this is where frameworks are helpful right scheduling scanning and diagnosis so now we are talking about diagnosis because you know scheduling and scanning ai is already there uh g healthcare sells machines philips sells machines siemens sells machines that have like deep learning based uh, things in them uh so but uh, in the diagnosis front so as uh, dr anurag just mentioned uh triaging uh, in emergency situations for critical findings is uh, something that is being done even today uh, so for example you know we work very closely with a company called cure.ai uh, many of you have may have even heard of them uh, I, in fact that first paper in the lancet was uh, was thanks to them so uh, so they already are deploying systems all over the world where uh, anybody who comes in the middle of a night uh, with a suspected stroke or with a uh you know road traffic accident and gets a ct scan done they are uh you know their ct scan is passed through the ai algorithm and within a matter of seconds there is an alert uh that is issued to the technologist or to the radiologist through whatsapp or phone or you know paging even believe it or not uh that you know so and so patient abc uh there is a high likelihood that he has an intracranial bleed uh please look at the images first right because in many parts of the world uh, you cannot actually start treatment without the radiologist signing off on a particular finding so if a radiologist has 50 cases to read uh how does uh, he or she know uh which is the case that has the critical finding so that is where ai is helping and that is happening today uh similarly uh, automatic delineation of normal versus abnormal scans uh so if you think about it uh, uh more than half of all chest x rays done across the world are normal uh, or unremarkable and uh, still uh, you know a radiologist uh, is required to look at all 100 scans and not just the 50 abnormal ones because again we don't know which is the normal and which is the abnormal so there are uh, systems that are being built all over the world you know there are at least 15 20 companies that are working on this problem uh, in fact we ourselves have published three four small papers on this where uh, you know we try to say that okay if you can have an ai algorithm that is very very good at screening out normals so what that means is it has a very high sensitivity uh, in the sense that it will not miss even a single abnormality then those systems can be deployed in radiology centers or clinics such that they don't miss even a single x ray with a finding but out of those 50% normal maybe 25 30% uh, 
percent can be automatically read by AI and then reviewed by either a junior radiologist at a later point in time or even let go autonomously. So I think X-ray and head CT are two domains where it's very, very uh, common. And, you know, most uh, hospitals across the world will start using these techniques in the next uh, few years. Uh, the other domain is of advanced post-processing. So, for example, uh, there is this company called HeartFlow. Uh, they are the only ones uh, currently that can uh, give you a FFR uh, value, which is a fractional flow reserve for on a for the coronary arteries using a CT scan. So normally, you know, you need to do an invasive cardiac angiogram to actually visualize flow across, uh, uh, you know, a luminal blockage in a coronary artery. So in order to see that flow, you need a special pressure sensor that you literally need to do an angiogram, you know, go up through the femoral artery, etc., to the heart, and then you measure the pressure difference across that. Uh, uh, you know, blockage to see, uh, you know, whether uh, or not there is uh, a reduction in flow across the blockage. So there might be a blockage in the artery, but is it call it causing reduction in flow? So that, you know, you need this really expensive, difficult kind of procedure to do the scan. This company in uh, the US called HeartFlow, big company, everybody like uh, in imaging respects them a lot. Uh, they have a, a technique using which they can give you that same information uh, through a CT angiogram of the heart. So through a CT scan of the heart. So, uh, so you know, so these are some of the technologies that, that will be coming in. Uh, but then, you know, as I said, there is this, there, many of these will start becoming, uh, you know, not AI uh, very soon. Like heart flow, you know, I don't think they even call it AI anymore. They just, they, they, they call it computational fluid dynamics right uh, cfd where you literally you make a model of the heart and then you flow blood through it inside and all of this happens inside the computer so computational fluid dynamics and so uh, so yeah and other other things you know uh, one of our our things that our group works on uh, very very actively is security so you know while uh, you know we all know the cutting edge examples you know every body part everything can be automated in due course uh, what is the downside of letting an AI algorithm play around uh, with these images prior to a human being actually seeing them? So we are working on uh, uh, algorithms that can uh, remove tumors from images, right? And make that image look just like a normal X-ray or CT scan, right? You can imagine the dangers of that. Right or you can insert Im uh, tumors into images. So, so you know, uh, point I'm again trying to make is uh, and just you know tell you that all of these crazy things exist. Uh, is that you know while it it there are all of these applications that are going to come in at the same time as as doctors, as nurses, as pharmacists, as you know people who are going to be working in this field. You need to be aware that you know there is this entirely new uh, aspect uh, as well. So. Uh, so yeah, then, you know, there are things like bone age. Uh, so most of you may know that bone age can be, so the estimated age of a person can be calculated by an X-ray of the hand. Uh, there are uh, several groups across the world that are automating that. Uh, pulmonary thromboembolism detection uh, has also been automated uh, to a great degree. In fact, there is a, a competition right now uh, that is currently on uh, by RSNA, the Radiology Society of North America, uh, where anyone can participate and start building models for detecting pulmonary thromboembolisms. So, so various, various applications out there. And uh, I think these are the few that you will see in the next uh, three to five years. Thank you, sir. This is so fascinating. Now, can I add a couple of uh, things to that? Um, so that was really, really a splendid uh, explanation what's occurring in the medical imaging end of things. Uh, absolutely enthralling to hear that uh, with her. But from a broad perspective, I just wanted to describe how the AI progression will work. So right now, because of the prowess of convolutional neural network, which is a type of deep learning, uh, there is increased applications in the medical imaging end, but there is also increasing amount of work being done in the clinical decision support systems, which are run again underneath by artificial neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and so forth. I think in the coming years, you'll be increasingly seeing uh, clinical decision support systems, which are run by AI 
kind of models. We already have clinical description support systems, but they are run by traditional programming computer software, what we call knowledge-based clinical decision support systems. What we'll be seeing is non-knowledge-based clinical decision support systems. But having said that, the caveat is that there has to be underlying infrastructure, underlying ontology, that's electronic health records. And not, as we know very well know, especially in India, not all hospitals have electronic health records. But there is one area which I'm really excited and I'm currently doing some uh, work in that area is um, clinical natural language processing. Right now we've seen a lot of hype around uh, GPT-3 and those kind of uh, vast data mining models and uh, text generation models. So I think that kind of uh, developments, I think, uh, give me a lot of indication as to where AI will be headed to in terms of uh, not just in generally, but also in terms of medicine. But also we're seeing trials in the US in terms of autonomous robotic surgery. I'm not talking about Da Vinci surgery. That's not AI at all. Uh, even though some people think it is AI, but that's basically robotic manipulation. What I'm talking about is truly autonomous robotic surgery. And currently trials are being held in California to do minor suturing. And this is amazing because you're talking about robots doing surgery on their own. And while it's early days to uh, predict where that will go to, but I think that's just showing promise. So I'm just giving you a light of kind of like what's coming in the future years. Um, there is medical imaging. There was a lot of maturity being achieved. Um, there are issues there which we do um, explain. But I also think there are other areas where you will be starting to see AI application. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Ranurag Agarwal. So amidst the ongoing pandemic where the entire world is desperate, you know, for a vaccine or a miracle drug of some kind, what is the role of AI in vaccine and drug development, sir? Sir, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Dr. Yeah, so I would love to say it's a huge amount, but in reality, it is less than we think. Um, there are well-described methods which are proven to work, both in drug discovery and in vaccines. They will take the first priority. There has been only one drug so far that can truly be called an AI drug. It was called Helicin. It was invented uh, basically last year. And the work went on for many years. It's a truly new class of antibiotics that came out of AI. Uh, however, that's an exception to the general rule where what AI helps us with is quickly screening a large number of potential leads, identifying a list of things that have more potential compared to others, shortening the number of things we need to test thereby accelerating drug discovery, but the, few, the you know controlling this pandemic will not come from new chemical entities. They will go through long safety trials and so on. It will come primarily from well done clinical trials of probably existing ideas regarding how the disease will be treated. So I'm going to go back to the Vidur type example and say AI will help us by running those trials more efficiently. It will help us by collating the data and making sense of them better. It will help us by identifying expression pathways of put like, you know, genome sequencing data, of uh, uh, transcriptional data, of trying to find pathways that are being dysregulated by the disease to give us some new ideas. The insights will be human. AI will simply give us a few more ideas to think about. And otherwise, both vaccine and drugs will pretty much proceed along conventional lines, just helped along a little bit by AI. And the other management, you know, testing, China did, people were being monitored by thermography in the streets, x-rays were being read. Those are good examples during a particular state of lockdown in a particular type of country where everything could be done. It's not universal. The rest of the world cannot do many other things they were able to do. I'll stop. Thank you, sir. Dr. Reddy, since Dr. Vidhu talked about the aspect of security in the field of AI, do you really think that artificial intelligence can ever be a threat to our jobs in the field or can AI can actually overpower us with the passage of time? To answer your question, I'd like to adopt what um, the American Medical Association in terms of their view and perception of AI is. They don't see it as an artificial intelligence, they see it as augmented intelligence. 
And uh, quite a while ago, a few years ago, there was this uh, quote coming about, um, I truly don't know where it came from. It was about saying AI is not going to replace doctors, but it's going to replace the doctors who do not know about AI or do not engage in AI. I think there's some wisdom in it, some part of truth in it, in that sense that it's not just AI, I'm talking about uh, technology as such. When you graduate or the current doctors as years progress, uh, when you start to see hospitals and health services adopting technology, whether it's AI, Internet of Things, VR, AR, or any other things, and you get a set of a cohort of doctors who can well use it, and then you get a cohort of doctors who resist it or not use it, obviously the health services will find it difficult to sort of continue to support the cohort which doesn't get engaged. In it. And the other aspect to my answer is just like nuclear energy, nuclear energy can be uh, nefarious, it can also be benevolent. So when you get nuclear energy to be used for farming, agriculture, medicine, and so forth, it can be a good thing. And so forth is fire, you can use it for cooking, but it can also be used for burning down houses. So the way you utilize AI at this stage, um, is how you will uh, get the outcomes. At some point of time, when we start to see artificial general intelligence and artificial intelligence getting sentience, that is getting a consciousness, we can't truly, then the uh, bets are off. We can't really predict, but that's science fiction now. When you look at the probabilistic models, when we look at the challenges that AI has in terms of how the uh, models get incorporated in clinical workflow, and that's why I keep referring back to that example of Google's diabetic retinopathy screening model. In Silico, it was wonderful. There was a lot of hype around it, but when it started to be adopted in practice, then you start to see the problems of AI translation to medicine. So I think it's a while away before we can even think of AI replacing any aspects of doctor, what they're doing. And even in aspects where uh, Widow is working in medical imaging, there's so many issues that we can uh, kind of count, uh, look at. And then uh, you were talking about other nascent uh, areas where there's AI isn't really mature. So we're talking multiple years away. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, in a live setting of, uh, say, management of chronic diseases, how is two-way learning between the physician and the AI system ensured, sir? Um, Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Reddy can... Very short this. answer, it's not. Very short answer, it's not. So while it, you know, when we speak about AI, we talk about how there is continuous learning possibility, where every time you classify something, it gets better. That is entirely in the domain of Google and searches and uh, things that don't have medical legal liability. In actual medicine, any commercial solution that involves an AI is regulated, which means it is not changeable and not changing from the point of time of it is approved. Now, as a researcher, you can do continuous refinement, and then you can go back to the regulator, and then you can tell the regulator again that you can do this. So for example, uh, let's take an example that is not a regulated product, but is a proprietary to Stanford. Now, every time a new patient comes to Stanford, you can get a informatics consult, which basically means you'll find previous patients similar to the patient that has just come in and give you outcomes and course for such people. So they are giving you matching patient within their own large EMR. So, and if you have a rare patient, this can be very valuable, but this is not a commercial product. It is simply a consult. The, so you can keep learning. Every time you, they give you a bad one, you can enter why you thought it was bad. It'll learn a little bit more. But uh, these are projects which you can learn back and forth. And then there are proper AI solution, which almost by definition will be regulated products. So you can't. They are fixed in time. Maybe Vidur has something to add on this. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll just add a quick thing. You know, So guys, you have to think about this, right? Let's say you are sitting in your OPD. Uh, and you're sitting in your and you're uh, managing diabetes patients right and you have this excel sheet uh, into which you just keep writing you know so day one vidur mahajan came to me 
you know his sugar fasting sugar was 185 i gave him uh, you know six units of uh, rapid acting insulin and he became fine or whatever you know and you start maintaining this excel sheet and uh, you know three years later you know some other patient comes to you and says uh, with a with whatever complaints and all you do is you know you just filter through your excel sheet and you say okay you know what have i done with sub, such patients in the past right and and you use that and you superimpose your clinical judgment on that knowledge and you prescribe a medicine right this is what happens with everyone right literally as you are learning medicine or as anybody is practicing medicine they are all the time uh, you know uh, accumulating their thoughts and then the next patient is hopefully treated better than the previous one uh now the and you know excel is not ai like you know excel could be it could be a notebook it could be whatever you know uh, uh anything now the thing is the moment excel starts suggesting to you uh that okay excel has done some kind of analysis and based on that the next patient should be given uh you know 10 units of insulin uh and the patient goes into hypoglycemic shock because of those 10 units of insulin uh, uh who uh, you know uh, how do you regulate that so that's where i think dr anurag is also coming from that the moment machines start one is you know so you have to understand this nuance one is you deriving an insight from information the other is a machine deriving an insight from information and then suggesting something to you They, those are very very different uh, you know things so the the first thing happens every day so we are all continuous learners uh, the second thing uh, uh, will definitely be regulated and and as as sir mentioned you know it's it's probably going to be a very long time or, or it'll be a very complicated way in which uh, you know we'll figure out uh, regulatory mechanisms for for such uh, processes uh, i feel but uh, but you never know thank you sir Uh, since we had almost an hour long talk about ai and what all we can do it and what all it is promising to us i have a question to raise to all the three of you should ai in healthcare be considered as an extra skill for which we learners have to step up or shall we incorporate into our medical learning process and take it as a pursuing subject for ourselves please enlighten us i would go with the american major minor concept it's an optional subject uh, you should all be made aware of what is happening that is absolutely goes without saying why should entirely be optional that you know the nuts and bolts and the toolkit should be optional knowing how it will change the frontiers of medicine is compulsory that would be the best way in my mind absolutely sir dr reddy dr bedu would you like to say something please go ahead vedor i'll follow you yeah. no, i i uh, completely agree you know it's uh, you should be you should be aware of the possibilities but then you know you guys have so much to learn yeah i'm like you know, i'm sure you have by now you have chapters on covid 19 also so <laughs> you know so so it uh, so i don't think a, a deep dive uh, would be necessary for everyone uh but uh, but you should you know you should be aware and then you should be aware of it to the extent that you know if you if you want to go deep into it then then you go deep into it if you and if you're not interested by it then you're not interested by it like it's, it's fine right like if everybody if every doctor started doing ai like what would uh, you know sandeep anurag sir and i do so <laughs> but you are also a doctor right <laughs> correct so i got a standard response to somebody who asked me should we incorporate ai into the medical curriculum i say ai is not an island really it works in the context of data science in health informatics so you can't just train people in ai and say that you know we are ready to go and start to operate in the real world in the real world e health is much more broader you have got electronic health records telehealth and so much you know medical terminology like snomed ct and all of those things so all of those things are really important in terms of how ai operates in terms of the clinical environment so if you were to uh, just 
trained people, doctors or healthcare professionals in AI, it isn't, it's meaningless. It's very moot. I think there had to be sort of the overall context has to be taught. I also agree with with or you can't just um, expect people in their medical curriculum, in addition to what they're learning, it's quite intense, what they're learning in terms of the biomedicine, biomedical subjects to have an additional sort of programming and data science incorporated. So it's going to be asked to be in, integrated into the sort of medical curriculum with you have the biomedical aspects and then how technology offense that particular application uh, helps with that current scenario. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming to the last question for the evening, uh, which is for all the panelists. Uh, do you think we're nearing an age where AI can entirely replace physicians or are there certain scenarios where human judgment can never be replaced? In my opinion, we are still at a very primitive stage of AI. Uh, AI is barely able to have a conversation. So despite whatever we saw with Google having a natural conversation, the fact remains make it slightly complicated, it cannot have it. Humans are around for a while and insights. A very nice example I'll take from a book that I recently read. AI is still at the level of, you know, the eagle trying to look at a dodging mouse and trying to figure out which way the mouse will run its patterns mostly. While human thought is Einstein imagining they are sitting on a light wave and the fields are now static. And now you know that electrical field and magnetic field cannot be static at the same time. And therefore the light wave cannot be, you cannot ride a light wave, which means you must have the same velocity, no matter where, what point of reference you are at. That's insight. So I think a very, very far difference, uh, handling counterfactuals, thought experiments. First stating what is impossible than imagining it. Computers aren't there, forget about AI. So I think a long way to go. No reason for people to worry, but Sandeep made a very, very nice statement that is said often, Doctors who use AI will replace doctors who don't use AI. And he said the correct version of it already. Technology friendly doctors will start gradually replacing technology non friendly doctors. AI is just one more technology amongst many others. I'll stop. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mahajan, would you like to add? Uh, sure. Like, you know, I totally, totally agree with what Dr. Anurag said. And uh, uh, yeah, so short answer is no. <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think we uh, physicians are going to be replaced uh, by AI anytime soon. I don't think many jobs are going to be uh, replaced in entirety uh, by AI anytime soon. Also, you have to see that, you know, uh, clinical decision making is uh, probably the epitome of cognitive ability that one can operate at, right? It is not only do you have to consider facts related to the patient, you have to consider facts related to the patient's families, related to emotions, and, and then you have to communicate all of it in a way that is actually appropriate to the situation at hand, right? I, I don't think AI can do that right now. It's like, you know, your, your stethoscope, Nowadays, there are stethoscopes that can detect murmurs, but, uh, you know, like beyond that, you still have to decipher what it, what it means or whether it's just a stetho rubbing against somebody's hand, right? So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't think anytime soon. Dr. Eddie, would you like to add anything? Yeah. So if you look at the mathematical basis of current AI models, they're largely working on a probabilistic basis. So prior to the emergence of deep learning, we had a school of uh, AI called symbolic AI, which was basically utilizing an expert system kind of approach. But the limitation with that approach is when the emergence of big, big data, they couldn't really compute that kind of data. They couldn't unravel the complexity of big data. And then you have this perceptrons, deep learning, this kind of uh, multiple layers, which were able to crunch big data. And then you started to see the successes with uh, medical imaging, with other areas. So that sort of kind of is dominating current AI. Based on that underlying mathematical basis, it's very unlikely they will achieve the human level understanding because they don't take into account the context in which the medicine operates. So that's going to be a major limitation with the deep learning approach. 
having said that, if you want to combine the symbolic and probabilistic score, thoughts or the symbolic model, it's very likely that you will start to see an evolution of AI from what we are seeing currently to that point where it is artificial general influence. It's a, at this stage, it's purely science fiction. Nobody has attempted it. There are a couple of papers that are coming around it. But if they were to come across that barrier, I would say, you know, you know, I may be sounding contrary to Anurag and Vidur. It's very likely to happen. Having said that, uh, it's very important from a regulatory perspective and from uh, a governmental perspective or from a medical training perspective, there is always a human in the loop element that's incorporated. If that is established, we shouldn't be worrying about whether AI is going to replace doctors or AI is going to be unsafe. There's always a human person who's overriding the decision or rather oversighting the decision. On that note, we come to the end of this amazing panel discussion. It gives me immense pleasure to wholeheartedly thank our panelists for taking out time and showing interest to address our delegates and with great enthusiasm and zeal to give them a brief about the world of artificial intelligence and what is the future for us in it. And of course, as a general population, it was very knowledgeable indeed listening to all three of you and sharing this virtual platform with you. Of course, it wouldn't have been possible without our organizing coordinators, for which I'd like to thank Madhav sir, Samajlum sir, and Tarun sir. And of course, Arundhati for being such a support throughout. I'd like to congratulate the delegates for they could come across such great dignitaries and get to collect a lot of informative stuff for them. Thank you everyone for attending this panel discussion. I, Raj Kaushik.